Hi, Alan. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my kind request that we all mute our microphones upon entry while we're le letting people into the waiting room. Um, the moderator will start off the meeting in the next three minutes. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, apologies for the late start by eight minutes. My name is Alan Maleche. I will be your moderator for this session. I want to first of all welcome everyone and just to remind colleagues that uh, please, if you do need to raise any questions, kindly use the chat box feature. We are quite a number of us joining the call and uh, we shall not be able to hear everyone. And so would want for you uh, to please type as many questions as you have, directing them to the respective panelists uh, that we have today. I want to start off by saying that uh, this has been organized by the COVID Rights-Based Approach Initiative, uh, which is a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder platform uh, with partners across health, governance, economics, and the informal sector who are collaboratively working to monitor the governmental response to COVID. Uh, you'll remember a number of us wrote uh, letters uh, to be able to advise the government uh, to use a rights-based approach. And this is a series of webinars where we have that conversation. Uh, today, we speak about the right to health. And on speaking about the right to health, I'm sure everyone is familiar with what the constitution says. Uh, that everybody and every Kenyan or every person in Kenya has the right to the highest attainable standard of health. But what that exactly means is what we need to be able to discuss, uh, especially within the times of COVID. And we are all aware of the essential elements of the right to health, uh, issues of availability. Uh, do we have enough uh, hospitals? Do we have enough trained medical personnel? personnel? issues of accessibility, uh, do we have uh, enough healthcare facilities that people can actually go to without being discriminated? Are those services being given there acceptable to those who need the services and are the services of good quality? So these are, and then of course, we must also remember the right to health is not just about the absence of sickness, but is also guided by the underlying determinants of health, meaning you need adequate food, you need safe drinking water, you need good sanitation, you need good housing, uh, and you need good healthy working environments and conditions to be able to thrive. So today we are gladly joined by a number of panelists, uh, uh, both from civil society and government. Uh, we have Dr. Catherine Ngugi, who is the head of programs at NASCOP and the Ministry of Health, who is joining us. We have Alan Draghi, the executive director of Kanko. We have Angela Nguku, who is the executive director of White Ribbon. Uh, we have got uh, Mr. Otieno from Amnesty International, and we have Ms. Murenga uh, from Lean on Me, who are going to be our panelists. Uh, because of time, I will quickly turn it over uh, to uh, Angela. And Angela, I'll begin by asking you to tell us a little bit about uh, the study White Ribbon Alliance has undertaken uh, as a listening exercise across counties, uh, in the counties, uh, as regards to citizen access to healthcare in the current times, 
uh, what are some of the key issues that citizens are raising based on what uh, your team did? So over to you, Angela, you have about seven minutes to take us through this. Thank you, Alan, and good afternoon, colleagues uh, in the sector. Um, I will start by talking about uh, briefly about a study that we uh, actually let me not say a study it's a, it's a listening exercise that we do we do that a lot in white ribbon because our work is around hearing the perceptions of citizens and then be, being able to take those voices to where they ought to go and uh, together they can come up with a way of responding to the issues that they have, uh, they have come up with and so um, we did a listening exercise in april and may to basically understand what is the impact of COVID to health uh, in general in, in, uh, in the country? And with a very, with a very deliberate link to, towards um, um, uh, reproductive maternal newborn health that is our main uh, docket as White Tribune Alliance. So we, we wanted to listen to, 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 to citizens yes, in general, but with a clear focus on the most vulnerable, that is women and girls. We were also very deliberate in our listening exercise to understand what is going on on the ground now that we know we're in a pandemic uh, not anyone was ready for the pandemic, uh, but um, um, ideally it has affected all of us in one way or the other. So we wanted to listen to those critical audiences that are not always heard, the rural women, the the able differently, the young girls who's living in informal settlements, among other groups that are always left out um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the discussions. We were not so much concerned about the numbers, but so much of who was responding and what were they saying and why were they saying that. So we, we focus on six counties. One was Kajiado, Bungoma, Kisumu, Nairobi, especially the informal settlements, Narok, and Vihiga. So basically, we were focused on counties that we, are, we have a presence or we have members uh, presence. The people that did the listening on ground were basically our champions, our citizen journalists, our community champions. And this was spread across all age groups in terms of um, our young people from 18, um, to as old as over 50, because we wanted to listen to everybody, to listen to different uh, perspectives of different people. So we had chiefs in there as mobilizers and as listeners, we had community groups, we had uh, county workers, health workers, and even citizens in general uh, in their different populations. Uh, given the fact that um, we have um, the laid down protocols in the COVID response, so we took into consideration the current social distancing and other laid down uh, protocols in the response. So we did WhatsApp calls, WhatsApp uh, uh, discussions, phone calls amongst groups, especially women groups, youth groups, um, um, and so on. We did uh, social and physical distancing um, uh, interviews. We had recorded conversations and verbal reports from community groups, especially on known cases, uh, where we wanted to understand whether there's anyone who knows somebody who has delivered at home, whether there's anyone who has uh, gone to a health facility and they have not been able to get their response and, and so on. So we got, we were able to reach the 389 uh, respondents within the timeline. And I want to take us through the key issues that we got, we were actually picking from the tool, our listening tool. So the key issues were around issues, information of the disease, information on how the, the COVID has impacted on their everyday life, the impact on health with a very deliberate focus on uh, productive uh, maternal and newborn health, and the curfew, which uh, we had been told that it has affected so many people across the board. Um, on the information on the disease, we realized that so many people are aware of the disease, and the information has reached different places, even in, in far places in the islands in, um, in, in, in Rusinga, uh, as far as um, uh, the rural, some of the rural places in the counties that we are working in. Uh, the only problem that uh, we realized with that is that the information on the disease is different across board. And I'm sure I'm speaking to a population that has had most of these things across board. The disease has been, the origin of the disease, the impact on the disease, the presentation of the disease has been interpreted differently in the different places. So there, there lies a loophole in terms of what is it that ought to be done. Information on every day, on, on every day uh, life impact on the, of COVID is that, of course, it has disrupted the economic, the basically the social economic, uh, welfare of people has been disrupted if, uh, um, across board the, the six counties. But our key focus was on impact on health. And this is where we, I will be basing my recommendation in the next uh, two to three minutes. So on, when it comes to health, and especially on the reproductive health, health generally has been affected in that when people go to the health facility, the way they go today is not the way they used to go uh, in the past. So there are very few people who are going to the health facility. Some health facilities have been closed. 
because health workers either are not able, are not having the appropriate uh, measures to go to be able to open facilities, to be able to attend to people. But in some places, they're also not able to reach to, to, to open the health healthcare facilities early in advance because of the curfew or late in, um, in the evening because of the curfew. So there's also that, that impact. But there's also the other element of people are afraid of going to the, to the because of myths and misconceptions, to go to the health facility because they're afraid that they'll catch the disease when they go there. In some places, we've got cases where they're saying, we, you cannot come to the health facility unless it is very, and that is very key, unless it's very, unless you are very sick. Mothers who are pregnant have been most affected in most of these places, especially at night, because there are some places where the health facilities are closed at night. And so they are not able to go at night because they have been, they have been closed. And so the curfew also has come on board and it has impacted on all this. So women are delivering more at home. There have been so many cases of uh, reported cases of home deliveries um, at night, especially. And in some places, also health workers telling health uh, people to go back because they are not ready to come. So they cannot go to the facility and stay long. In some places, women have been um, sent away after delivery. They have delivered, yes, but they are sent away the same day. Or if um, the next day, uh, based on what, how, how your situation looks like. So it's not so much because we are following the laid down guidelines, but it's so much because we, we, we really have to respond to COVID. And so the issues like this, we might catch the disease, we don't have what it takes and so on and so forth. Of the impact on the curfew has been the most felt, I must say, uh, cross board. Um, with uh, with most of the uh, with most of the the, 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 the respondents talking about um, not able to attend facilities at night, and these are people who are with emergencies, and also people with uh, people with who are pregnant, women who are pregnant, and so in in some places like we have cases in Kajiado, in case we have cases in Kisumu, in uh, in, in Naro. Um, in Bungoma, where women are not delivered at home, not because they cannot go to the health facility, it's because either they got the health, uh, they got the, the, the border border people to take them to the facility, they tell them, no, we cannot be able to go, um, we'll, be, we'll be harassed by the police, or in some places they want to go, they go to a, to a taxi person, they are told the same thing, and in other places they genuinely fear that they, they were not able actually to go because they are fearing the curfew. Of course, I know we appreciate that there have been efforts that have been put in place to ensure that people are informed that they can actually go to the, uh, to the facility at night and be attended to. But how this information has reached different people is a, um, is a different thing altogether. So that is also um, another aspect that uh, we, we came across. That said, I, I, I want to say that um, I'm sure even as I'm speaking today, there have been so many surveys and many reports even from the media that have talked about the different impact that COVID has had on health, all the access, and um, especially during curfew and also during this COVID time. I want to make, um, I want to make a case, I, I don't know, uh, uh, with, uh, with, um, with, um, with Harlan, the, the moderator, um, um, allowing that uh, they are, we need to really be very deliberate in the, in, the, in the recommendations that we are giving and taking forward as a country, how then best do we ensure that the COVID response takes into consideration all stakeholders involved, citizens being part and parcel of it, because the response is majorly by, led by the government to our citizens, but is it impacting us in positively or negatively? Is it helping us in ensuring that COVID is responded to as it ought to be, or is it making things worse for us? Uh, moving forward. Over to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Angela, for rapidly trying to go through what your listening tool brought out. We will be moving to Maureen Murenga next, but I think key points to come out from your conversation around the challenges of the curfew, the ability of people to address, uh, to access healthcare services at night, especially emergencies. Uh, so thank you for that. We are turning to Maureen Murenga, and uh, Maureen, welcome uh, to the panel. Uh, Maureen, uh, being a person who's worked closely with communities of persons living with HIV, uh, those affected by TB, being a mother, working in an organization that's looking at issues of children and young people, and uh, also being at the mix and at the helm of a certain governance body at the global level, would want you to reflect on what uh, uh, Angela has uh, noted and also talked to more about what has been the perception of the people that you've worked with and your own experience. So over to you, you have seven minutes to highlight for us what are some of the key things that are coming out from the community perspective. Over to you, Maureen. Thank you very much, Alan. And um, um, I am really excited to be part of this discussion. 
especially now that we are witnessing very mixed, uh, I mean, very un uncertain circumstances brought about by COVID-19. I will begin by saying that um, the COVID-19 pandemic was not really um, expected. We didn't expect that times will change very difficult and uh, movements would be limited and uh, we will have very limited access to the people we work with and the people we serve. And therefore we, some of the things that we are expecting, we don't have like timely solutions for them, but we have a bit of recommendations for what uh, we are seeing at the community level. Uh, first of all, I would want to say that uh, as health advocates, we receive a lot of information and complaints from members of public on challenges they face in accessing health services within the county and, and, and the counties and within um, um, generally around the country. So the, uh, reduction to access to services isn't something new, but this has been escalated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So some of the challenges we have uh, so far received from um, the people we serve, the people we work with, um, lack of adequate and uh, modern equipment, especially for diagnosis. I know, I know some of you have seen <laughs> the kind of test that happens with COVID-19. It's very scary for some people. And the reason some people won't take the test is that they don't want that thing going up their nose. They, they, and and they, we see a lot of people wincing. So we don't know if this is the, the best way to diagnose or this can be improved. And then we don't have much testing because we are only testing the active sick cases, but not the latent cases. And then we have seen the issues at the facilities. The facilities, because they have to reduce the numbers of staff working, there's a lot of understaffing in health facilities. And um, that also hinders access to health for many people that we, we have heard from. And then um, there's also the ability of uh, the resource constrained uh, citizens or citizens who, and these are the majority of the citizens. By resource constrained, I mean, I want to use the word poor, but they cannot afford quarantine services. They cannot afford um, healthcare services. They are so scared of leaving the house if they have fever because they are not sure that if they meet the thermogans that are now widely spread with our uh, security guards and their, their temperature is found to be high, they could be um, quarantined and yet they are not ready to facilitate their quarantine course. And then we have also um, inadequate physical accessibility with the lockdowns and the restrictions of movement. Many people are not accessing healthcare services in, time, in a timely way. And then uh, the not so polite treatment by the law enforcers. We have seen people beaten to pulp by the police officers for either not wearing a mask or being out um, after curfew time or, you know, just not following the Public Health Act and taking the public, it, it kind of criminalizes COVID-19 because if you're found um, either not wearing a mask, I know it, it, it's, we have responsibilities as citizens to keep up with the public health requirements, but the kind of mitigation that is done to those who violate these uh, instructions sometimes is very, very harsh. And then the information that is, is given or the information around mostly is passed through uh, media. Some people don't have access to media. Some people right now as we speak have been moved away from their homes by floods and they're in, in situations where they have no phones, no media. And so um, there's need for us to uh, improve because we have uh, right to information is also part of a uh, right to health package. And then the blanket lockdown rules that have been given by government sometimes. And, and I know, like for example, Isili has been locked down and there are people in Isili who may want to leave Isili to go and seek medical services. But, and then policemen will allow, but take an instance when a pregnant woman or someone is very sick at night, the taxi driver may take that person to hospital and that person could be, could be admitted. But on coming back, the taxi driver will have no evidence. Of, of driving late because they took someone to hospital. 
So this is making them very reluctant in, in assisting people who need to go to hospital, hospital at night and especially having impact on people with diseases such as blood pressure that need immediate action, pregnant mothers, you know, babies don't say what time they're coming and they don't know curfews. So with these repercussions, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, reduced of detection of cases. Right now, like I said, we are only detecting those who are extremely sick, but we are not uh, getting those that are in uh, latent stages and, and these ones could easily be cured. And then, um, so we will see a lot of preventable deaths. We are told we haven't reached our peak, but with these kinds of uh, reduced rights and lack of access, we may, we may reach our peak with very, very horrible uh, statistics. And then uh, the emergency medical treatment is uh, greatly impeded uh, due to the requirement that uh, people should not move uh, at certain times or that um, certain locations are completely locked. And so you need to go through a process to get emergency uh, medical treatment. So with these kind of challenges, we see that uh, our governments have not uh, fully realize the right to health for residents in this uh, COVID-19 situation. And by talking about rights, I'm talking about rights to accessibility, to availability of commodities. We want um, the, the COVID-19 services to be acceptable and uh, of good quality. So those four key areas, accessibility, availability, acceptability, and quality of health services is still far-fetched within the COVID-19 uh, response. We have also seen very reduced um, models of accountability. We, for example, see a lot of resources being raised for COVID-19. We can't place how much it is. Uh, we get sometimes very harsh news around what it is used for. And um, it, it is a clear um, indication that sometimes it's not responding to the immediate needs of the people and therefore calls about the issue of engagement of people and, and uh, consultation with the citizens in order to prioritize what is important to them at the moment. So we are calling on, on um, the county governments and the government and the health uh, providers to develop patient-centered health policies around COVID-19. We can learn a lot in the HIV response where uh, there's a lot of consultation with people living with HIV and also developing uh, programs that respect, promote and protect the rights of those it is intended to serve. We, we haven't seen this and I know it, COVID just came, but again, hey, we are developing policies. We are bringing guidelines. We are shaping uh, practices. We need to step back and say, all these need to come it should be the backbone, it should be the foundation uh, uh, focusing on the rights of the people. And then also we need a lot of enhancement of uh, accessibility for other health services. We know COVID-19 is not the only epidemic we are fighting in Kenya. We have HIV, we have TB, we have malaria. There are also epidemics. And now we are going to the malaria endemic season. If we continue in the normal, um, if we continue with our status quo, I think we are going to see uh, a lot of mortality, especially among children under five years and pregnant women. So I think we need to um, enhance accessibility, not only of COVID-19 services, like some hospitals are now doing. They're only taking emergency cases and COVID-19 cases. I think we will have COVID-19 with us for a while. We need to now start opening up for people who need to access other um, services for other conditions to be able to access. It's just a matter of changing how we are structured at the health facilities and bringing in policies that can still enhance prevention, but allow uh, facilities to provide other services. And then uh, the issue around embracing innovation, COVID-19 is actually pulling us to the, towards that wall. We have been very reluctant. Just the other day, Ministry of Health used almost 15 million to print and that 15 million would have gone towards support, supporting the poor families or the families that have lost their source of income to get some food. And then we use our computers and internet and, and, and the applications that university students are well able to make to enter data of those who are going. In fact, we are reducing as much as possible 
paper transactions, but the Ministry of Health still had to print uh, to millions of, of, of shillings. So, and then we also need to ensure uh, citizen participation in discussions around budgetary availability and allocation for COVID-19. So we need to start asking for accountability. Oh, we saw Safaricom writing a check. KCB wrote a check. Where? Where is this money going to? So as they give us a brief on numbers saying, oh, today we had 89, they should also give us a brief on how much we are raising and what we are prioritizing on. So I think the civil society organizations also have a role here uh, in terms of sensitizing the community uh, to improve our attitude towards uh, respecting the public, um, um, public health requirements that are needed in this time, and also participating in the decisions around investment and also implementation of the COVID-19. Other stakeholders such as development partners um, have an opportunity uh, to also support in ensuring that uh, there's that um, um, duty bearer and uh, rights holder, uh, respect of rights, and uh, that uh, healthcare providers are trained to ensure that rights are respected. There's a way sometimes if people who are found, especially in a part and they have been taken to the quarantine area or to the hospital for, for testing before quarantine. There's a way we have heard that they are treated or some words that are told to them that makes them very uncomfortable. And I know that sometimes the healthcare providers are, are overstretched and they're wondering why people have to do what they're doing. But I think there's also a way we can address this uh, mis misconduct in a way that doesn't scare people from wanting to seek services. So good right treatment at the health care facility, provision of adequate information in a way people can understand is something that can be supported. And then we are also asking that the development partners to increase funding, especially to county governments where services are happening for improvement of the health infrastructure. We have seen a lot of emphasis being, a lot of um, uh, attention being given to Nairobi, but we also know that um, in as much as we have many cases in Nairobi, these this, this are soon spreading, spreading sorry, to the other counties and people will need services. Some countries are well prepared, some need a lot, a lot of support to ensure that they're up to speed. And when they start receiving uh, many cases, then they're able to attend to those. And then to members of the public, I think it's important for us to uh, um, participate in some of these decision-making processes, especially around budget making, around development of policies and legislation. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. That was indeed a lot and uh, very comprehensive. I'm sure it lays the ground well for Beth uh, from Amnesty uh, to quickly talk to us about, from a point of view of Amnesty International uh, Kenya, uh, issues of human rights violations, practicalities around quarantine centers, and people in the informal settlement. Uh, uh, Beth, over to you. You have seven minutes. Let's try to stick within the time. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. I think I'll be very brief and stick to the point. And basically, uh, most of the information we have and the data we have obtained from engagement with human rights defenders that we work with from various spaces and uh, some contact with people who had been quarantined in some of the facilities. And generally, when you look at the experiences from the quarantine center, there seem to be some element of stigmatization, sorry, and criminalization of, 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 of COVID. And this is based on the fact that that mandatory quarantine is being used as a tool of punishment for those who have been who have been taken to those centers. And uh, this is not good, particularly for, for, for addressing the, the effect and response to, to COVID. And then second, when you look at how the contract tracing is being done they are looking for, for criminals. Looking at the words, for example, term being used by the Ministry of Health, they're rounding up people. Basically, this negates the old issues around contact tracing, and it gives contact tracing a negative connotation. And then thirdly, looking at the situation in the quarantine centers is not something that somebody can be happy about. We have had issues around complaints on access to food. The food is not of good quality. 
it is not enough for the people in quarantine. And then secondly, issues around congestion. Like for example, we saw in the case of the KMTC quarantine center in Siaya, people were crammed into rooms and basically it beats logic around the issues around uh, social distancing. And then of course, thirdly, poor sanitation. The facilities are not up to standard, expected standards. And this one impacts on the people in quarantine. It discourages you from going to quarantine centers. And then of course, fourthly, there are all issues around access to information on testing results and then social distancing. It seems information is not given at par, is not consistent across all the quarantine centers. And we saw previously complaints by the people who had been quarantined over the, the, the lengthening of, of, of the quarantine period. They're not being informed, for example, on how they should manage social distancing. And if this will have been impact on them being put on more quarantine period. And then fourthly, which for me again is a concern, access to mental health services, the psychological torture caused by people who have been rounded up without being given more information, without being informed the reason why they have been picked up, without being given access to mental health services, I think is a major, major concern. Then of course, lastly, but not lastly, the issue around detention in quarantine centers of an unpayment of fees. We remember some time back, the Ministry of Health stated that people will no longer be paying for, for them being quarantined. But in the last two or three days, I've seen cases of people being asked to pay before they're released. The, the latest case has happened at the Kenyatta University Hospital Center, where I think two or three people have raised issues around them being not allowed to go home, and yet they should be released. And then going ahead and sharing the experiences from informal settlements through our colleagues and through our partners, we were able to engage with HRDs in Mombasa County, particularly Moroto and Bangladesh informal settlements, and then Nairobi around Kibera, Madare, Korogosho, and then uh, Mukuru. Then from uh, then largely also from Shangishu, engaging with our partners, working with the with people from a Mubut forest, a number of issues have been raised. For example, access to water and sanitation in the form of set settlement is a problem. Just to give you an example, for example, in, in Moroto, the ratio of one toilet to the population is around 10,000. This is very impractical, particularly when you're trying to practice social distancing and trying to practice good hygiene. Then the other thing that has been raised, I think by Angela and uh, Murenga, it's around access to emergency services at night. It's a big issue. And we'd be able to receive a case of a woman who lost a baby in Kibra simply because she could not access a health facility at night. And this basically, I think, is, is impacts on a lot of people. And then the other thing is around inadequate access to PPE for health workers. It makes them very reluctant to even receive and serve patients. And this impact on, on their right to health for majority of, of the people living in those areas. And then the other one is around just fear of testing and mandatory quarantine. As I said before, the way it has been done is creating a lot of fear and people are not able to come over and even be tested. We saw the case in, in Kawangware, in Isili, even in Mombasa, people are afraid to go for testing because they know the repercussion once the test is positive. Even we saw, I think in Mombasa, Old Town, some people who tested positive have basically disappeared. They don't want to go to quarantine and this one must be addressed. And then next, the issue around patients being sent away from hospitals because they don't have face mask. And you know, as you know, for some people choosing between buying a face mask and, and food, they'll go for, for the latter. And basically I think it denies them access to, to medical services. And then lastly, the whole issue around the high default rates for NHIF, as we know, the foreign economy has had challenges. Many people depend on that economy are not able to get income, for example, to even pay for their monthly NHIF rates. And eventually it will impact on the ability to be able to get services through here because of the, default, the high default rates that you may have. And then lastly, what needs to be done given 
all this is happening in terms of how do we address the situation, particularly from a human rights angle. One of the things I'm thinking immediately that can be done is to immediately release all those patients, all those contacts in quarantine centers who have been held for non-medical reasons, particularly payment of, of the fees. And then secondly, something I think that we have worked within the RBA platform, basically reinforce mechanisms for human rights sensitive mandatory quarantine. It is important to encourage people to go to quarantine center, to exert accountability, and basically to make the experience in the facilities more favorable. And then thirdly, basically see if you can have mechanisms for enabling people from informal settlements and other areas basically to access emergency services, particularly during the curfew. I think for me, this is very important. And then one of the things which for me, in terms of addressing issues of access to face masks, what if the Ministry of Health could avail face masks in the facilities? So that even if I don't have a face mask, I can go be registered, given a face mask, and then be treated. And then lastly, find mechanisms to question particularly communities from poor backgrounds against the NHIF defaults. I'm sure our MCS and our MPs, this will be a fertile ground for them to engage and, and do something that is not political. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Tortieno. Uh, the danger of Zoom is that I can't come and take the mic away from you, but thank you for all uh, the additional points. I know we are pressed for Time and we also want to have a chance for people to contribute. But I just want to point out that there's a very rich conversation going on in the chat. And I know we have colleagues here from the county that have seen a colleague from West Pocot. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I believe we have colleagues from the development partners. So if there's a question, a comment you can make and respond to keep the conversation going in the chat, that will be greatly appreciated. I request the panelists uh, to also be on the lookout in the chat, especially if you're not speaking, to see if there are things you'll eventually respond to when you come to give your concluding remarks uh, or when you give further interventions. But let's not uh, keep a blind eye to the conversation that's going on in the chat. I will quickly turn to Mr. Raghi uh, from Kanko. And uh, Mr. Raghi, having had uh, this whole entire conversation of uh, the challenges in quarantine, the stigma communities are facing, the fact that you're going to have multiple pandemics if we don't take care of COVID well, uh, the challenges that Angela raised in terms of women being able to access maternal health services. Uh, do you feel that there's any hope and what can the community do? So over to you, Mr. Raghi. I do plead that you try and stay within the seven minutes so that we can get more questions and a conversation going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and the members. One of the things that we all realize is that there's a lot of hope because people have the ability to acquire taking the challenges. But I would say the government did its first few days good work. They raised the issue and we had it. What we have not been able, been able to do, and this is the opportunity, is to bring people so that people can take responsibility and take action. By making people fear, that should be the responsibility of stepping down of government and allowing communities to take over. One of the things that we all know that if people cannot walk to a dispensary or a testing center willingly, it does not matter how much we can push them. And that's why we are going to see more numbers. And having said that, then how do we address the community fear? How do we ensure that people do actually present themselves so that we can actually control the disease? The first thing is say this disease is curable, this disease is preventable, but not wearing the mask on behalf of the Minister of Health. And believe me, if you walk up, out wherever you are, you see men and women hanging masks on their necks, but they are not covering their noses. That, those are not masks. Those are just trying to move. And we have come up from the past where we built toilets for the doctor. Uh, and therefore, basically, for us to make a difference in COVID, communities must be at the center of the response. And therefore, whether it is resources, whether it is information, they must be focused on people. You see, in the recent past, we have seen stigma as a big issue. And the most recent it was, I think it was in Moranga, where even buying a fruits from that community was actually like a challenge. And basically, we have, we have actually not been able to address some of those issues. If we don't do it, we'll go nowhere. 
Uh, and therefore, for me, if we do not bring the communities at the center of the response, we are here to stay. We lose more people, we lose, we lose more money, but we will not go ahead. And a good example is where we have used communities. For this discussion, let me look at other people uh, who have, we have been working with, people who live with HIV, people who have malaria, people who have TB, and people who are right now having big challenges because they themselves have been challenged. They are the biggest, um, let me call them, uh, the biggest opportunities after getting COVID are the same people that we have actually been working with because their immunities are compromised. What have we done about people living with HIV on TB, on malaria? And, and like um, Marenga was saying, we're just about to get there. So basically, we have not addressed those issues. Instead, what we have actually been able to do is we must, we, we have scared people, we have sent them away from where they have been getting drugs they cannot come to pick. I'll give an example. If you have been accessing uh, drugs, especially for young people, many times they, they travel a long distance. They cannot access those drugs because between Nairobi and, and Naifacha, you cannot cross. And therefore, what we have happened is we have had people skipping their ARFE take up, and therefore there'll be more resistance to, to the drug. And, and, and therefore issues of like, uh, uh, getting other support services are not there. And, and as a result, you find that you, you will have more uptake of diseases. We have looked at, we cannot access food because of the, the level of poverty there is. We have lost jobs and that kind of stuff. Because of that, in TB alone, that 4% of the TB patients are now seen as uh, lacking food. And therefore, you all know that for you to have food becomes important. Then uh, we, we know that Somebody have talked about the curfew and curtailed movement. Many of the people you actually were in NSPs or use math and others basically cannot access because they have to travel long distances. How does can that be controlled? They cannot access um, methadone or anything like that to become difficult. If you are newly uh, diagnosed with the HIV or TB, you cannot get, get more than a month uh, dispens dispensation of drugs. And this becomes difficult for people to look at. And there and many other opportunistic infections. Um, we may be seeing rise in STIs and that kind of stuff because we cannot. I'll give you an example. Um, in Coast Province recently, for you to enter the hospital, you have access to show a CT card. Basically, that is, is denying somebody's right because for you to, to show a CT card means I have to say, I'm HIV positive, I want the drugs. Yet, have been told before, I can access them before. Therefore, the effect of COVID, we, that's some of the things we should be able to look, look at. We have looked at issues of uh, sexual reproductive health. Again, we all know that we cannot be able to support, and we have seen the girls that say they can do nothing. And what do you think they are doing beyond um, the, the possible access? So issues of immunization. Um, Mothers cannot take their children for immunization, and therefore they will skip all that and becomes very difficult for us to look at. And finally, if we expect the community health workers to work, yet they have no information, they have no PPEs, how do they do the home visit? How can they go and help? They themselves have the, the risk of getting infected and therefore becomes a challenge by itself. And therefore, we need to be looking at broader things that can make a difference. And one thing that we have known, and like somebody said, we have seen more money, but where is civil society? The civil society have actually almost taken a back seat because it's like too high level uh, issues. And therefore, for me, if you have to have the challenges addressed, we must start engaging civil society. I've seen some, some people commenting that we, they have not even seen anybody talking about the, some of these issues, but there is something that we can actually be able to, to, to address. Um, and then there is the issue of the young people. We have all suspended their meetings, uh, joints. I remember why we had the peer-to-peer -peer support is because we thought that would work. What is going to happen? How are we going to look at issues of stigma? How are we going to look at issues of viral suppression? And these are some of the things that if you have some of the 
our colleagues in the, in the donor community, they can help us to look at some of these. Is how do we actually improve on, on the thing? And then lastly, I want to say, lack of nutrition support to clients is a major issue uh, because unless we give food, it becomes one major challenge and we'll see more um, uh, impacts on lack of food. And, and then because of that, there'll be either, like in communities, we have started seeing highlights of, of um, small, uh, you know, deaths here and there, and, and basically people stealing food because they cannot support. So there is need for us to look at all these kind of um, issues and also look at the issue of limited access to justice, especially for girls and women. There are many, many women uh, because of, of the situation that is that we, we have happened to look at it. Where is Nyumbakumi? How much have we talked to them? We have done extremely very little for them to be able to make that difference. So I think having said that, do we have hope? Like I said, I believe there is something we can do. Um, and therefore, basic things like somebody have said, provision of face masks for purposes of control becomes important. However, it's not just because the policemen have to ask you, but it's because it is important that we, we look at this. The issue of the communication of abuses, whether it's people living in different units or APs or other based violence, becomes important so that we can use evidence to actually make uh, an instance. What I know Dr. Goge is here, but one thing that perhaps we need to see is the integration of some of these things and getting the partners to start looking at some of the the these abuses or lack of access to drugs um, and many, many other things. And then we need to look at, like somebody have said before, for us to be able to address stigma, we should realize the person who has already been diagnosed with COVID is still the same person who was with us yesterday. And therefore, that when that person is declared non-infectious, um, it should be um, reunited with the people. But who can do that? It's not the chief, it's not the police officer, it's community health workers. But where are they? They are nowhere because they are not being supported. Uh, we need to look at issues of comprehensive training, literally training that can help most of these groups to actually look at the, the, the issues that we need to look at. And therefore, going back to what we can do, we need to engage community health workers in the quota training, raising of all these groups, we need to engage our leadership and policymakers um, as champions for an integrated COVID and uh, disease and other diseases. Because I don't think it will be, be going away. Because unless we do that, whether you are a member of parliament, whether you are an MCA, whether you are heading an organization like Frank or the other, I think we need to have all that kind of thing. We need to have uh, bigger issues in terms of health advocacy. That is not happening. And therefore, everybody in health, including ourselves, have actually like, waited too long. And, and going six months into this epidemic, basically, if you don't act now, there'll be a problem. We need the budget alignment. Um, we all know what uh, there is uh, the writing of Global Fad and ACADOC, but there has been a very limited uh, looking at the, the way we we can actually respect to the issues correctively. So, so that when we are talking about HIV, we are talking about COVID. We are talking about TB, we are talking about COVID. We are talking about immunization, we are talking about COVID. That needs to be integrated. And therefore, we need to have the leadership, both from civil society and government. And I'm happy to be here so that we, we, we take away, uh, we pick away from what the minister is telling us and actually make it community. So basically, and, and all that will help us. The last thing I want to say is making it simple. If I want to be tested right now and appear like, I, it, it, by the time I get to the hospital, I know either I'm coming back or not going back. Yet we know in the, the, in the quarantine centers, we can actually um, be able to support communities to take care of their own people. That has to be brought on board because in some of the countries they have done quite it becomes difficult if we are being threatened. If we are seen, it becomes like 
even as if is not as guarded. Uh, and therefore just becoming sick, making you a criminal, it's not right. Yet we know how this disease is done. So we have done a lot of work in uh, HIV before. We have seen all these things. I think we need to tone down and get people the, the new facts, the natural of that. So in my opinion, uh, that's one of the things I want to say, that we must provide the leadership. We cannot just leave it to the Minister of Health to do it. He's, he has done his part. We need to do our part again. And therefore, with that becomes the responsibility of all, all the other health workers, including civil society. Thank you. Thank you. I know we are pressed for time. So for the panelists, there are a few questions I want you to think about responding as I turn to Dr. Ngugi. I think uh, for Maureen Murenga, there's a question about uh, why is uh, donors only engaging the national government and not county governments in terms of funding? I think that's a question you may want to address. Angela, there's a question around the fact that uh, now that we have a communication law, how do we minimize many forwards that are doing the rounds given contradictory information on COVID? I know that there are also questions about do we have any mobile clinics or vans in the community? Uh, Bez, I think you may want to address the question about whistleblowers uh, who are sort of feeling attacked uh, because of the, them trying to expose what is right uh, in terms of the pandemic. So is there anything that Amnesty is doing around that? And also Angela, in terms of speaking to increasing public awareness, and also we may want to also hear about young people. If there are some on the panel, we'd be happy for you uh, to open up the chat. But for now, I have to turn to our colleague uh, from the Ministry of Health, uh, NASCO, uh, Dr. Catherine Gugi. I know the issues are quite many. Uh, we'll give you about 10 minutes uh, to be able to bring the perspective and also trying to reflect on some of the concerns we've had so far uh, from your perspective as NASCO, as a person from MOH. Are there any reflections you may want to give in terms of what are the opportunities the government has put in place to engage citizens? How do we draw a lot from the HIV, TB, malaria response? and the SRHR response to be able to benefit from the trust of the community. So over to you, Dr. Ngugi, but I encourage people to keep the questions coming, but also where you have the ability to respond to the question, please feel free to do so. Over to you, Dr. Ngugi. Dr. Ngugi, if you're speaking, your mic is muted. Please unmute it and then speak. Okay, as we wait to get Dr. Ngugi back online, maybe Angela, could we start off with you with some of the responses? Thank you, Alan. Um, I think what I'm getting, and not just the responses, but also what I'm hearing from uh, whoa, um, the different uh, people who are coming up to ask questions, is around, I'm almost hearing the listening exercise going on again in the chat box, because people are talking about misinformation going on and uh, in a, an availability of uh, masks, um, health workers are not having PPEs and the like. So I think in my, I think as I speak, oh, what I should be talking about is what are some of the key recommendations that we give? Because what they are saying is actually what I've heard and what I've, I've said in, the, in, my, in, in, my, in my earlier talk. And I would say that we all appreciate that this is a pandemic that has caught us unawares. The government took the first stage. And however, as we go along, this the strategy of response must change to ensure that all of us, uh, fl we flatten the curve and get back to our normal lives. And so what I would say that uh, in, in response to the questions asked is that there should be deliberate considerations now to ensure that the lived experiences of citizens, health workers, the realities of health workers, the realities of communities are brought to the table in the response modalities. I feel like that is lacking because every time we, we, we hear the response uh, taking stage, it's all about these are the number of people, this is what ought to be done, this is what, 
I never really get to hear a point, and I really want us to get that to that point. And I wish we had um, another conversation where we have the government people responding and maybe listening in. Maybe also they need a bit of uh, that learning from our side also, because NGOs and CSOs and community groups have been there supporting governments for a long time from grassroots, as Alan Draghi has said, from grassroots to the national level for a long time. I feel like us being put on the back burner is not helping in the response. And so I, I, I'm, I'm imagining a conversation where we could be able to have these government uh, bodies or the state actors in place to basically just listen to the realities and the lived experiences of citizens from the CSO perspective of their own perspectives, basically responding to some of these issues that we are hearing. I've seen the government task forces have come up, but the, the, the task forces are not having the people on ground. The lived realities of these are the realities. These are the issues. And the issue of misinformation and myths come out from there because you have put us on the back burner. What do we expect us to do? We are going to talk to ourselves because no one is actually coming to listen and take what we are saying and taking it to the center stage of what where you are making decisions. So I think for me, that needs to really be um, deliberated and as a CSOs, we need to think what is the best way then of ensuring that we take this what we are hearing to the to the to the county governments and to the national governments. The other thing that I'll talk about is that um, we, there should be to, to avoid the assumptions because there have been so many assumptions that every time that something is reported on a daily basis, this information reaches the people, and when the information reaches the people, we are there's an assumption I think from the the the, the, the daily uh, updates that they, this is taken by the media or the people who are supposed to be playing that. At the level, and it reaches the different people across board at the same way, interpreted the same way, and people are supposed to act the same way. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. And that's why we are hearing so many people doing things the way they want. Masks are being worn for the police, masks are being worn because it's a directive. It's not because citizens are, are supposed to, we are supposed to be respond, we are supposed to be helping in the response. And so the fact that that um, speaks to the earlier point that I said that citizens feel that they are left out in the response, and so they are reacting the way they think. We do this because the police have said so. There's no coronavirus. It's being, there's so much information going around. And at the end of the day, the, we are seeing a lot of community spread of the disease. So at the end of the day, how then do we ensure that we avert that? The only way to do that is to ensure that in the response, citizens' perspectives are taken on board. Other sectors, a multi-sectoral approach to this needs to be taken into consideration. I think um, all along, where, where we have succeeded, not just in Kenya, but globally, is where all stakeholders, all sectors have come to play. And COVID is one such sector. We are, the sector of security is involved here. Yeah? The sector of health is involved. Education is involved. Um, infrastructure is involved. Um, information is involved. So then the, the, the major stakeholder, 80% the citizen, is left out. So we come out and do our things the way we think, because we have not been in, in, embraced in terms of our realities and our experiences to really give uh, feedback on what how this uh, response needs to be shaped. So I think that needs to be to 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 be um, taken into consideration. As I finish, I, for me, a well coordinated most sectoral approach cannot be left out. We should be moving from where we are now, a one a one state led way of response, to a more a coordinated well coordinated most sectoral approach that that it takes into consideration everybody's everybody's role, and that is the only way that we feel that we can be able to to we should be able to do that. Health workers. Should be on the table. Community health volunteers should be on the table. CSO should be on the table. Citizens should. We seem to have lost Angela. Could I quickly go to Maureen and uh, then Otieno and then Alan, just each taking two or three minutes to respond to the questions? And then we'll come back to wrap up. We are having difficulties connecting Dr. Ngugi. So over to you, Maureen, if you can hear me. Yes, Alan, um, I can hear you. And one, one thing I want to say about why, well, how to answer that question. It's one of the most difficult questions to answer. But I'll say that um, we we have we know that health is a devolved function and uh, that most services happen at the county level in fact a, a huge percentage of the services happen at, at at county level but you see some of the donors that are around are looking at us to to guide them because this is something that's changed before we were 
devolved, the, the, the donors were here, the development partners were here, and they used to have uh, bilateral discussions with the government. After devolution, again, we need to now advise them on how they need to change. And we have seen some of them actually prompting this discussion and asking uh, us to, to, to guide them on how we can ensure that resources are actually at the country level where implementation is happening. We have seen the counties try to develop a, a certain mechanism. And here I'll talk about the global fund without a lot of support, especially from the central government and from um, civil society. Some of these changes will only happen if there's a lot of advocacy, if there's a lot of uh, uh, participation by citizen asking for that change to happen. And I think this ball comes back to us. What are we doing to ensure that the development partners are funding um, counties where services are happening? Thanks, Maureen. Uh, uh, we'll be back to you again to give your closing reflections shortly. But uh, Bez, over to you. The issue of whistleblowers, the issue of uh, the mobile vans, and then uh, there's actually a question, are there actual cases that could be litigated uh, to take forward? So over to you. Okay. Start with the last one. There are very legitimate cases which can be litigated just a matter of collecting more evidence and following the right channel and due process. That is very possible. And then just to respond to some of the questions I've seen online, one, Winnie has raised the issue around as the pandemic, addressing the pandemic, you should not only look at rights violation, but you look at the citizen having more responsibility for them taking charge and trying to protect themselves. For example, putting on a mask, that is very important. I think it should be done because rights always go with responsibilities. And then Nelson has pointed out that it is obvious that during emergencies, that government have a tendency to downplay human rights. It's like human rights suspended. I don't think in any circumstance, human rights cannot be suspended. They're always in existence and they must be protected and people should be accorded their rights in line with, with, with what is available in our legal statutes. And then uh, the issue around uh, prosecution of whistleblowers, I think that this is not right. I think whistleblowers are protected according to our current statutes. They should not be prosecuted. In fact, what the government should do, they'll be using the information from some of the whistleblowers and the journalists basically to, to, to improve on, on response and, and managing, management, also to address any legitimate concerns which might be impacting on, on, on the fight against COVID. And then lastly, I think Peter has asked the issue around communities being left out in the response, particularly being denied access to information. When you deny people access to information, there's tendency for people basically to start creating stories and a lot of rumor, rumor mongering and a lot of those we see in the social media. So I think access to information is, is very important. And again, it is guaranteed by our constitution, particularly Article 35. That's all. Uh, Alan. Mr. Raghi, any quick responses to the questions around what we can learn from the HIV response to involve the community? And then uh, we'll do a last round of uh, responses before we close up. And just to say that because we cannot get the colleague from Ministry of Health back, if there's anyone from the county government or anyone from the development partners that wishes to speak, uh, maybe for a minute or two and reflect on something, please indicate to us in the chat. We'll be happy to give you space over to you, Mr. Ragi, to reflect to some of the questions you've seen and some of the questions that have come up and one has also come up, including access to masks and PEPs for healthcare workers. So over to you. Yeah, th thank you very much, Alan. I, I think we all know that communities become paralyzed when they are threatened. And therefore, moving forward, COVID, was seen as a short-term challenge. It's a long-term challenge now, we know. And therefore, we must be able to look at um, opportunities where we have to talk to people and the leadership to say, we need to explain a little more. For example, if I turn positive today, why? He said, because 
I did wrong, or is because I was exposed and that kind of thing. And then what is it can we do? So that at the end of the day, me, my family, my friends are able to take action. If we don't do that, it becomes very difficult for my village, my everybody to take on that. And we have actually a lot of opportunities. We can actually do specific campaigns on how to use a map without what is coming from the, the business community or what's coming from the, where community health workers can actually demonstrate that we can speak and we can all use the mask as we go along without necessarily. If we do that, and the social distance part, part of it becomes. Be clear. The second thing is we need actually to look at basic things in public health where we get people annoyed enough for the action that they take action themselves. And that's how we get people to take uh, to, to be responsible. That if you do well, if you act well, then you have the benefit. We are actually not seeing the number of people who are the 80 percent who are not getting infected or keeping the distance. People in churches, people in the health centers, all that, that we, we, we need to actually to start speaking on that. And I know I started doing some of the, the researches, have been, the hearing they have been hearing. How do we start to hear what happens to markets? How do we keep all that kind of thing? And then engaging members of parliament and the other leaders. This is possible, but as we all know that we have actually come from a place where everybody uh, went either, um, let me say, for lack of a better word, disappeared from their normal places. But I think there's opportunity for us to start looking at engaging members of parliament and, uh, and engaging uh, elected leaders if we have to move in the next stage, because if we don't do that, there'll be no enough resources, whether national level or community level or whatever level. And finally, I want to say, we as civil society must fight for their space. When Alan was actually introducing ourselves, we said, we have written letters. This morning, we actually wrote letters demanding to get substantial man, uh, amount of budgets coming from global fund. That has to continue across the board. And we must actually be able to, to identify the areas that we can help. The community health workers will do nothing unless we orientate them. Our leaders will not put the budget unless we can show the budgets are working. And therefore, for me, we need to look at, but more important, we must do all these uh, guided by the community level engagement so that we can actually be able to buy their buying in and we can buy their commitment. I don't think it's the money that matter, but I think both civil society communities and government must look at ways and means within the, the, the knowledge we have that we can now engage and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ragi. I'm informed that Dr. Ngugi is back online. The challenges of connection online when you have a sole Kenya Power Provider and bundles uh, based on a service provider uh, affected her, but she's back. Uh, Dr. Ngugi, if you can hear us, we would be very glad to hear some of the perspectives on your side. There have been a rich number of conversations going on. So over to you, Dr. Ngugi. Glad to have you back and that you're able to reconnect. Uh, you have the remaining 10 or so minutes before we wind up. Um, okay, um, first of all, my apologies. I had um, in the middle of the discussions, I had um, um, some issues. Uh, first, I want to appreciate the platform um, that you're having to discuss more on uh, COVID-19 and the impact to health. And I think first of all, I want to put a disclaimer that I do not uh, speak on behalf of the Ministry of Health. I speak based on the experience that we have regarding to HIV. But to um, Minister of Health, definitely, I think you can see from the time we had the first case and even before that has really been committed despite the, you know, the hard unscripted events of the pandemic. And definitely here we know that we are fighting an enemy who, you know, is not well known, um, not only in Kenya, but as well all over the country, all of us are learning about it. Uh, you know, with the very dire consequences of a, a very short time based on what we have been seeing on media and from other countries. We have definitely made uh, significant steps, but we all agree um, that uh, we, have, uh, we have an enemy 
within our midst. And I think the recent numbers of the past uh, few days um, can be able to tell us, um, you know, where we are, knowing that we are at level four um, of the community to uh, community um, infections. And it is not really looking good, but we hope that uh, with more mass testing, then we are able to, um, to know where we are and be able to deal with it. We thank God that mostly we have asymptomatic, but we know for sure that um, the ones who have been symptomatic, we have had good recoveries and good percentages out of that. Um, and the mass testing right now is uh, doing well, knowing that right now in the country we have more than 10 um, laboratories in 10 count, more than 20 laboratories in 10 counties um, having Nairobi having eight more. Um, and samples is by yesterday, we did over 52,507 52, with more than 1,000 positive. So we definitely need to um, um, look into it more. And I hear the, um, the calls and um, the points put in by several stakeholders and communities to ensure that we involve the communities. But definitely we really want to approve the government in guidance given every day at 4 p.m. We have had many protocols and documents you know, developed to guide um, the continuity of services. And as well, we have had um, uh, 24 hours assistance um, of, uh, to the public, linking them to different um, departments. And I think most of you know about 719 and 0800 72 48 48, which is a toll free line where healthcare workers can be able to call for free, where World Bank through the Ministry of Health were able to employ more than uh, 50 doctors who are available 24 hours to assist um, our people. And the trainings that are happening every day, um, different forums, you know, like through NASCOP, we have trainings from 11 to 12 and 2 to 3 every day and as well as University of Nairobi and different other means. We acknowledge definitely the gaps and the challenges in implementing you know, the government guidances. And uh, we definitely no need to re-examine the priorities and you know, look at our system and the level of the preparedness. And we know that um, this pandemic has many challenges, especially on health and economic and as well as social. Um, I'll mention, um, just a bit um, in regarding to HIV um, and as well within the communicable and non-communicable diseases that we are really trying so much as possible to ensure that this continuity of services and our clients, we don't, put, don't expose them as we are uh, meant to uh, protect them, knowing that among the you know, compromise, we do not want to put them in a situation whereby um, they can get infected and knowing that we don't know yet the treatment of COVID. What I would ask um, is the um, your colleagues there and the people in this forum and other forum outside there is, we communicate through, um, through the uh, um, director general and as well the cabinet secretary and the peers who have really have an open door policy. So as you can see, how do we work together? And how do we ensure um, that we move together as a country? And we thank God for the several of the stakeholders who have been able to go to the counties and find out how are we doing? And I applaud as well the county government to have really put so much, especially at the beginning, we were having issues with PPEs, but right now at least we are somewhere, even though we know that the shortage is not only in Kenya, but it's globally and as well different partners who have come in to assist on, on our people. And so I would request that in general, that, and I hear you out, like the other communities who have written to me asking, is it possible uh, to be involved this and that? And definitely we have involved them. Let's know that who is government? All of us, I think, are within the environs of our country, Kenya. And we fight an enemy that we do not know. Not like, for example, the diabetes, you know, this is the treatment, these are the signs and symptoms. Every day they keep changing, you know? And if you have a way that we can contribute to the solutions of this, 
then we can be able to help. Um, and I think those are my submissions. Unless someone has a question, then I can be able to comment, assist on it. Thank you. Thanks. So we only have nine minutes left, and uh, I note uh, Peter with your hand is up. I'll come back to you if time allows. But I just want to go back to uh, the issue that have been raised and uh, say, Dr. Ngugi, as we uh, take Peter's hand because it's up, there's a question around what's NASCOP's role in the entire COVID-19 task force. But Peter, I allow you to make one quick comment because you're pressed for time, then I have to summarize and allow Maureen, Alan, uh, Otieno each to say just one thing they would want to take for this. So Peter, in under a minute, please raise your concern. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Ray Catherine, for the elaborate uh, uh, information. Uh, there's a feeling the government also is, in some cases, confuses a little bit on issues of human rights. Take the case of Makweni. Uh, on yesterday's news where a truck driver is tested at Mariakani, and then uh, he's left to travel up to Emali, and then he's followed up with the results that, oh, you are positive. Then he decided to drive back all the way. Uh, that kind of protocol is confusing to everyone because we thought there is a turnaround time that the truck drivers are withheld for two hours until the results are out and they can only be allowed to proceed. So such kind of confusion also the people feel the right of the truck driver was being violated and also it brought the scare to the to the county that we are going we are having our first case. So such kind of confusion and there are many number of that where there are the protocols are, are, are messed up. Can you comment on that please? So before Dr. Ngugi comments, let me start with Alan Ragi, one key point then Maureen, then Angela, then Otieno, and then Dr. Ngugi will close. Uh, thank you, Alan. I think for me, communities can, if only we support them. We have, we need to step down to the level of Dr. Goge so that we start programming for communities. We know the Director General have done his best. We know that some sectors have done their best, but we need now to go to communities and make them the center of our response. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Um, I, I think uh, we we heard a lot about human rights here, and we are we need to ensure that these are strengthened. Like I mentioned, human rights should be the backbone of COVID nineteen response. And while at that, we should not forget that we have other epidemics. That if we don't um, co continue uh, in the service to those epidemics such as HIV, TB, and malaria, we will see more deaths arising from these epidemics than from COVID-19. And finally, human rights cannot be handed to us um, just like that. We have to fight for them. And after fighting for them, we have to ensure that we don't lose them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Otieno and then Angela. I think for me very briefly, we need to find ways for destigmatizing and decriminalizing COVID-19 related interventions. Thank you. Wow, that's quite brief, Otieno. So Dr. Ngugi, I'm turning over to you to see whether you could uh, comment on the role of NASCOP in the COVID-19 task force and also the concern Peter Witte raised around communicating protocols, especially around truck drivers and then I'll try and uh, sum it up. Over to you, Dr. Ngugi. Um, let me first of all um, address, I know the question that has been asked on what is the role of NASCOP in uh, the whole of uh, uh, this epidemic. So um, one is our clients and our customers um, they are among the people that we are worried about, you know, to acquire the COVID-19 uh, uh, based on what we have heard and read from different um, countries. So what we did around 24th of March, we gave a guidance that was very, very comprehensive 
Um, and the guidance, I think most of you are, were able to um, go through it or were able to see it. Um, was, it was very comprehensive. Uh, it was a circular they are aiming to provide guidance to service providers at health facilities, uh, county governments, implementing partners and other stakeholders on strategies to undertake to ensure there's continuity of HIV prevention care and treatment for individuals living with HIV uh, in the context of potential increase in demands arising from the COVID-19 screening and treatment. And so in the guidance, we give issues to do with triage, you know, like within our HIV um, comprehensive care clinics and HIV testing case identification, what we expected. And then in ART continuity of care and treatment, and that's a part uh, we ensured that we gave, for example, the three month, month dispensing of ARVs. And during that as well, we the counties, you know, normally we usually give them three months um, of uh, stocks, but that time we, in the month of April, we give them four months. And then as well, giving prior to the priority populations, especially all pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and uh, newly diagnosed HIV patients. And then after that, the laboratory services, ensuring that we do not disrupt the services of EID and uh, viral load um, for our client, especially you know, as well for pregnant women and breastfeeding women. And then they give a guidance as well regarding the commodity management of the ARVs, and as well for the MAT programs in select counties that we usually serve. And as well after that, we give guidance on, uh, on, on, on how to report. There are different, different areas which have been of concern to us and still we are putting in mitigating factors, you know, issues to access to services in the case of restriction of movement. And I think at the beginning, someone mentioned, for example, um, you know, like the, where the roadblock has been put in Indica, um, you know, due to stigma and discrimination, our clients, some decide I will not take my drugs in Indica, even though they reside in Indica and take them maybe from Kandara and Moranga. The meaning that that roadblock implement, you know, uh, he beats, he, it's a hindrance to them to go and collect their drugs. And so we are working with the counties to ensure that um, they can allow them to pick the drugs from um, not maybe within the place that they reside at Pika Town and go to another area. But we are trying to work around that one as well, maybe even giving passes for them. The other area of concern has definitely been diversion of healthcare workers towards COVID-19 response. You know, and knowing that, you know, when COVID-19 came, all healthcare workers were pushed that and we did not want to ensure that our clients uh, miss the, uh, the services or they are disrupted. For example, we had to um, Moranga County and uh, Meru County. We received you know, a cry from the CASCO there that the, the healthcare workers who are supported by implementing partners around 50-50 were, were terminated uh, by end of March. And we appealed to the organization that uh, employs them, um, you know, the overall. And we asked, could you kindly consider bearing the circumstances that we are in right now? And we then got that they were able to hear our cry and be able to return the 50 and 40 from Meru County and Moranga County respectively. Definitely the other part is, you know, ensuring that we have the congestion of clinics. We have Ushauri that we still utilize, um, you know, so as to ensure that our clients are updated or abreast with what is happening. And as well, they can reach healthcare workers within the country. And HIV commodity and security, which we are having weekly updates to know how are we doing because we do, they do not want to run out of the stocks that we have. And like, for example, this month and uh, next month, we have many shipments coming in. And as well as effects on vulnerable populations. So in the COVID one, I think you know 719, no, all of you know about it. If you call 719, uh, if you say you need technical assistance or technical support, you are transferred to, to NASCO. We are the ones managing it um, and I'm the one coordinating it. Uh, in terms of the call center to ensure that, for example, if you have a case somewhere, then I we are able to link up to the rapid response team or the emergency operation center. And then a team goes there to collect the samples. We have around uh, 50 doctors employed and around 20 uh, staff from uh, NASCO who are, man who are doing it, who are within the center and then go for Westlands uh, that are hosting us, uh, no, for Safaricom that are hosting us in Westlands that we are there 24 hours having these shifts per day. So we are that committed. And as well to ensure that um, through the global fund, we declared some of the money that we had the savings. So as we can, be, we can allow that money to be, uh, to buy the PPEs um, and, to, and to ensure that as well provision of, uh, of, of other areas that uh, the COVID-19 task force that needed support with. 
And as well, right now, we even thank um, the uh, we thank the global fund that has given us another uh, stimulus fund that you can be able to apply something for. So NASCOP is in the middle of this response to ensuring that we are giving as much as possible. I think at the beginning you saw where we're having the quarantine centers and I remember like NASCOP, we were manning 10 of them and no seven of them that we really to give the best to us. But right now we are, our other staff we have given them, I think you know all of you, we have global fund application and they are addressing that one here other half are ensuring that they address the COVID-19. So we have not forgotten. And we ask you, we use open door policy. If you have any issues and areas that you think that you should really come in and assist or where we feel like we can do a bit better, please communicate to us. So as we can be able to tackle the pandemic, you have uh, better and have better results and as well protect our clients. Uh, in regarding to the track, I really do not have a comment on that. I would really address that question to our director general. I do not have expertise or issues uh, addressing on that issue of to do the track. It was unfortunate. And I think it was just maybe a miscommunication. But ideally, yes, when you, you are tested then and you're a suspected case, until you get your result, then you're supposed to go to the next uh, point. So I think there was just a, a hiccup there, ideally. And I think um, I will uh, reach out the information to our um, contacts within the ministry so as they can be able to know the gaps that we are finding outside there. But I ask you colleagues, let's not be so quick to criticize, but we be able to give the solutions that we have. We don't know it all, all of us, and we are trying really our best to give it back to our country. So I request, request you that you give the support, not only to the national government, but as well to the county government and we'll be able to tackle the problem we have before all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngugi. I think uh, we are right on time and uh, just two more minutes to conclude. I think the first point to make is that indeed we are all supportive of both the national and county government, but it seems like making that support and connection to happen in terms of communicating, having the information and having the support to communities being transparent and open is a challenge many of us are facing and what we've seen from the chat box. So as we talk to the DG about the truck drivers, I think you also need to talk about more spaces for them uh, to open up and see the community support system in place because there are very many willing and able people on this platform who can help spread positive messages. I think what we've also seen colleagues that there are rich ideas among people in the community and where we can and support each other, we can take those forward but also where there are human rights violations. We know what the law is. Uh, we know what is needed on board uh, in terms of moving forward. So let's document the cases. Let's use the legal system to try and get that to happen. We equally have noted the need to ensure that our healthcare workers are protected and also to ensure that there's transparency in terms of the funding that is uh, able to come through. I apologize, I'm not able to come back to everyone for a parting shot. Uh, but just to say that we'll continue the conversation online. Some of the questions that may not have been responded to, we'll uh, reach out to the panelists and see how we can be able to do it off a Twitter chat form uh, later on today or tomorrow in terms of keeping the conversation going, but that will take a bit of time to consolidate the question. Uh, thank you very much to the, Thank you very much to the over 60 participants who stayed in throughout the call. Uh, Nguva, I notice your hand is up, but we are out of time. So let's, uh, we'll share the recording once it's uh, edited and uh, put in a format that all can access. And we'll advise next on our next webinar and try to see how we get more colleagues from the county governments, also from development partners who can be on the panel uh, to be able to address all this. Thank you all and have a good weekend. And for those who celebrate uh, Eid, I enjoy your eat. Thank you very much and take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.